everyone, welcome back to this video. Now recently we've gotten lots of questions about how we run the air conditioning all night long just off of our battery bank in the truck. As a matter of fact, we don't just run the air conditioning off of our battery bank, we also have an induction cooktop, we have an electric oven, coffee machine, washing machine, and even an electric water heater. All run off of our inverter which runs off of our battery bank. Now, if you want to know how you could build a similar system to ours to run everything electrically without needing gas, stay tuned. So let's go through the basics of an electrical system. Now the heart of this system is always going to be your battery if you're using it for an off-grid application like our truck. Now to charge that battery you can either use solar, you can use something like a DC to DC charger, or you can use a generator. On the other end, because your battery is only going to output DC power, and if you want to run AC appliances like in your house, you're going to need an inverter. Now let's start off with the heart of the system, which is the battery. We built our battery out of lithium prismatic cells, and if you want to see how we did it, we'll link a video up here. Now, when you think of a battery, you need to think in terms of watts or watt hours instead of amps and amp hours. This is all related through Ohm's law, so watts is equal to amps times your volts. Now, for our case, our battery is 21 kilowatt hours, which is, in other terms, 840 amp hours at 24 volts. If we set this up as a 12 volt system, it would be 1680 amp hours at 12 volts. Most people always talk about batteries in terms of amp hours, but they don't ever talk about what voltage they're running at because most of them run at 12 volt. But if you run at different voltages, it's so much easier converting everything to watts and watt hours because that way it makes dimensioning your system a lot easier, which you'll see later in this video. Alright, so here we are with our inverter. Now your inverter's main task is to convert your 12, 24, or 48 DC voltage to your 240 or in the US 110 AC voltage. Our specific unit here is from Volticon Power Conversion in the UK. This is a 5 kVA unit, so it's capable of outputting about 4 kilowatts. So this unit can pretty much do DC or AC to DC charging, so if you're plugged into shore power at 60 amps, we can charge with about 2,000 watts of solar. We only have about 1,300 on the roof. Um, and that'll charge at 80 amps at 24 volts. Now, we've been testing this unit because we wanted to see if a residential solar inverter would work in a mobile application like our truck. And for the most part, it has. We'll get into the details later, but the ba main benefit of this is it's an all-in-one unit. Now, like most units, this also has an interface where you can plug into a USB with a laptop and change all the parameters, change all the settings, and also see what's happening at the moment. Or, the basic way is you use your little screen here. So at the moment, I can see we're getting 1.3 kilowatts of solar, which is pretty much our maximum capacity. Now, we'll go into how to dimension your inverter or your battery and all that stuff after we've gone through all of our components first. So what do we think about this inverter? Well, obviously it has the benefit that everything's in one box, so we don't need a solar charge controller. And it is the fraction of a price of, for example, high-end quality product like Victron. But besides all these positives, there are some negatives to this. So let's start with the fan. The fan is always running. So this is about idle speed of the fan. So this is the noise that you can always hear coming from this inverter. And the other thing that we really don't like about it is the idle power draw. 130 watts for an off-grid off application is just too much. It has to be somewhere between 20 to 30, at the most 50 watts, but 130 at no load draw is just too much. I mean, you use almost three kilowatts a day just to run the inverter. Now to our DC-DC charger. So we have a 50 amp DC-DC charger from a company called Olis, which is supplied by LifePo for Oz in Australia. We'll link LifePo for Oz in the description below as well as this specific model of DC-DC charger. So simply put, we wanted it 24 to 24 charger because, well, the truck's 24 and we wanted our house battery to be 24 as well. And we didn't want to have to step up or step down voltage. So why 50 amp? Well, we wanted to be able to charge on a cloudy day to be able to run our air conditioning or cook on the induction. So 50 amp was a pretty good option. 
the main manufacturers of DC-DC chargers make options for 15 or 20 amp, which just wasn't sufficient for us. Also, we put in a new alternator in our MOG because the generators generally aren't very reliable and don't output much power. So we have a 120 amp, 24 volt alternator. Now that at a low RPM, like idle RPM 700, uh, only outputs about 60 amps. So we didn't want to overload it by putting two of these in and trying to draw 100 amp out of the alternator at 700 RPM when it's idling. Now if you're wondering why I'm sitting down here, our DC DC is right there which means it's close to the battery which keeps the wiring short which you should do for any high amp draw applications. Now what do we think about this DC DC? We've been testing it for probably a year now and we like the customizability of it. It has an app you can monitor everything with and you can also change all the different settings for lithium, you can do lead acid, you can do AGMs and it has all the different charge voltages for each one and you can just do it by flipping little switches. Welcome to our solar array. So we have four 330 watt REC panels and actually that totals to 1320 watts. Now these panels are residential panels so they actually run at 36 volts and because we've series two of them each they actually run at 72 volts but these days MPPT solar charge controllers are very very efficient. They get 98-99% efficiencies so you're not losing a lot compared to the efficiency of the panels themselves. Now, we have seen a maximum of about 1.5 kilowatts out of these four panels, even though they're only rated to 1,320 watts. Now, the reason being is these are high quality panels. They're residential panels. They're from a reputable manufacturer like REC, Trina Solar, any panel that's made in Singapore, in Germany, Europe, UK, US, they usually have good quality panels. Now, there's always that kind of do I want to have an MPPT and go with a higher voltage panel or do I go with a low voltage panel like a 12 volt or 24 volt panel? I personally am a big fan of using residential panels. They are very, very robust. We've gone through the bush with these and nothing has happened. I mean, knock on wood, nothing has happened yet. But these panels are made with you know strong frames, thick glass. They have the very latest technology usually in residential or these big panels because they use these in solar arrays as well. So for example, you can get new panels. These are 1.6 by 1 meter. You can get the new panels are 1.7 by 1 meter and are 400 watts, 410 watts. That's a whole 80 watts more out of only 10 centimeters more space. And that's just because the cells are more efficient because the efficiency that they've gone with the newest materials and newest technologies to make sure these panels are most efficient. I would highly recommend go with residential panels if you have the chance to do it and the space. Now the other thing we need to talk about is the design. So because we have 1320 watts on the roof doesn't mean we're always getting 1320 watts into our system. You only get 1320 watts when the sun's directly overhead. So what we like to say is we have a peak time. So peak time is about four hours. Let's say around from 10 to maybe two o'clock where we'll get over a kilowatt of, of electricity just from our solar panels. Before that and after that, it varies. It'll be from anywhere between 300 and 600 watts. So a lot of people think, yeah, I'll get a 500 watt panel. It'll be in the sun for 10 hours and I'll get five kilowatts out of that panel. Wrong. You're only going to get those five kilowatt or that those 500 watts at the peak times of the day. You won't get them in the morning and afternoon unless your panel can face the sun directly. Now, another thing that we found very, very helpful is washing the panels, especially when you're on dirt roads like we are most of the time. They tend to accumulate dust, and once we've washed them, we've gained somewhere between two and 300 watts at times. So it's definitely recommended to keep these clean. All right, let's go into the dimensioning of things. Now this is gonna be a bit complicated, but try to follow along as we start. This is gonna be the easiest if you start thinking in watts and watt hours instead of amps and amp hours. Everyone knows 12 volts, so everyone always talks to you about how many amp hours are your batteries? How many amps do you draw here? Start thinking in watt hours. It's gonna make this whole process a lot easier. So let's start with the dimensioning of your system. So. Let's say we want to be able to run a system that will have an oven, an induction cooktop, and an air conditioning. So we know our oven's going to run three and a half kilowatts. 
our induction uses 2 kilowatts and our air conditioning uses let's say 500 watts ours uses between 5 and 700 watts so if you want to be able to run all let's say an oven and the air conditioning at the same time you need 4 kilowatts so you need at least a 4 kilowatt inverter this is why we have a 5000 VA inverter which is close to 5 kilowatts VA and kilowatts is just different notions with this thing called the power factor so VA is usually used to describe power generated whereas kilowatts is or watts is used in power consumed the difference between the two is pretty much just what gets lost in between from generation to usage let's keep that simple enough that's all we're gonna go into at this point so how do we go from here we've got a 5 kilowatt inverter now we have to think how long do we want to run all of these devices so if we want to run let's say the oven for an hour at three and a half kilowatts we want to run the conduction for an hour that's two kilowatts that's five and a half kilowatt hours that we need to be able to supply from our battery all right now let's say you want to run your air conditioning for seven hours a day that's three and a half kilowatt hours that you need to also be able to supply so you need your five and a half kilowatt hours for cooking oven and induction as well as your three and a half kilowatt hours for your air conditioning gives you nine kilowatt hours that you need to be able to supply from your battery for that day now one thing you have to remember now is you can't take your battery from 100% full to 0% empty. You will break or ruin your batteries that way. Generally, AGMs and lead acid batteries have a depth of discharge of about 50%. Try not to go any lower than that. Lithiums, you can theoretically go to 20%. I would highly recommend keep it to 30 if you can. So let's say we go with 30% lithium batteries. Now we have 9 kilowatts that we need to be able to supply. So 30% depth of discharge, we need to be able to at least have 12 kilowatt hours of battery storage. Now you see how this whole thing comes together with using watts and watt hours instead of amps and amp hours. If now we said, okay, we need 12 kilowatt hour battery, how much is that going to be in amp hours? Now we have to divide by our voltage of our battery to be able to find out how many amp hours we need. That you're going to have to do eventually because, well, once you figure out what voltage you want to run your battery at, you're still going to have to be able to, set, to pick out individual cells or batteries that you want to run parallel or in series. I hope that makes sense. I know this is a bit to comprehend at once, and I'll try and get, well, I'll have you get it put in all the formulas and stuff as well. In the end, it's all related through Ohm's Law. Watts is equal to volts times amps. Let's try and stick with that. If you've got this part of the system mastered, you also have to remember, leave a bit of safety margin. There's going to be things that you don't think about. You know, running the coffee machine for 10 minutes a day, doing a load of laundry just in the middle of the day, your fridge that, you know, you forgot about. It's going to be running all day long. It doesn't draw much, but it still uses electricity. And also, the inverter. Anytime an inverter inverts power from a low voltage DC, like 12, 24, 48, to 240, there's going to be losses. Lots of inverters have 90 to 95% efficiency. So if you want to invert, let's say, 100 watts, well, you're going to need to be able to provide at least 105 watts, because your inverter needs those extra 5 watts to run and do the whole power conversion. Now, that's scaled up to things that use, you know, three and a half kilowatts is going to make a big difference. You're talking about 100, 200, 300 watts extra. Now, our inverter particularly, we're a bit frustrated that it has a very high idle power draw, which is when the inverter is not actually doing anything, it's just sitting there, but it's still running and on. So in case you do plug something in, it just runs and you don't have to go and actually physically turn on the inverter. That being said, there are lots of options out there that have very low idle power draws somewhere around 10 to 20 watts which is ideal because that way if you don't have anything plugged in it doesn't use much power okay. I hope I've now convinced you to think in watts and watt hours making the whole design process a lot easier for example if you think of a blender that you want to use that uses 250 watts if you use that for an hour let's say which is exaggerated it uses 0.25 of a kilowatt hour 
which is then easy to calculate what sort of battery percentage that is in terms of your total battery capacity, instead of having to convert back and seeing how many amps that device is now going to use. Anyway, enough of that. If you have any questions, just leave us a comment below or send us an email. Now, let's go into a bit of the more techie stuff of this thing. Why go with a 12 volt, 24 volt, 48 volt system? Well, simply put, the lower your DC voltage is, the more losses you're going to have when you convert or invert to a higher voltage, like 240 volts AC. So at 12 volt, you're going to have more losses than at 48 volts, which is why a lot of off-grid systems are 48 or even 72 volt systems. Now for our system, we wanted to go with 24 because, well, our truck's 24, going straight from 24 to 24 off the alternator gives you another easy way of charging. We personally haven't ever needed a generator. We either have to plug in every month or so to actually fill up our batteries, or usually if we just drive, we'll run their DC-DC charger and it'll charge up our batteries again, even if the sun isn't out. So why go 12, 24, 48? Well, 48 is used in a lot of off-grid applications. So 48 is one of the go-to systems for inverters, for battery packs that are already ready, readily assembled, BMS systems, charge controllers, all that stuff easily is, there's heaps of gear out there for 48 volt systems. Same for 12 volt, because, well, 12 volt is very common for cars, because most cars are 12 volt. 24 is one of those things it's becoming more popular because, well, trucks are becoming more popular, and trucks are generally 24 volt. You also have the benefit of not having to have as many losses from 24 to 240. Also, you don't have to run the same wire sizes. So, for example, when we draw power out of our battery through our inverter to run our oven, our oven is 4 kilowatts. To be able to provide that kind of power, we're drawing almost 150 amps, which is a lot of amperage for one cable. So you need to dimension your wires correctly. If you're using 24 volt, your wire diameter is going to be half or half of that what a 12 volt diameter would be. So right now, we needed to run 70 square millimeter wires from our battery to our inverter. We ran 95 just to give it a bit of extra. But if you were to run that in, well, 12 volt systems, you'd have to run a cable that's 140 square millimeters or even bigger. So you're talking about a giant cable. So I hope that makes sense with the 12, 24, 48 volts. If you can, go 48. There's lots of gear out there for it. It's not too hard to find, for example, DC-DC chargers that'll go from 12 to 48 or 24 to 48. And you just don't have as many losses if you're running as much 240 volt as we are here in our truck. We went 24 because it keeps it simple and because we found all the gear we needed for it. Now one topic that we haven't talked about in our battery video is fusing. Proper fusing for lithium iron phosphate batteries. I see this mistake all the time when I look at people's systems that have normal like professionally built systems. They use ANL fuses on lithium iron phosphate batteries. Now if you look at the spec sheet of these prismatic cells, lithium iron phosphate prismatic cells, you need to be able to interrupt a current of 20,000 amps if these batteries internally fail. ANL fuses are only rated to 15,000 amps interrupt current. You will need a class T fuse to be able to interrupt 20,000 amps. Make sure you use a class T fuse, please. If you need research, do your research on it. If you have questions, send it to me. Happy to help out anyone that has any questions on that topic. Now, the other thing, your DC fusing. These days, you can use two options for DC fuses. You have your regular blade fuses, which are pretty straightforward. They've been in use for a long time and pretty simple. Blade fuse goes, pull it out, put a new one back in, and hopefully problem solved. Well, you should probably find the short first, but it's pretty straightforward. You also have DC circuit breakers. Now, if you're going to use a DC circuit breaker, make sure you use an actual DC rated circuit breaker. AC current is much easier to interrupt because of the sine wave property of the AC current. It means it pulses pretty much. So that's easier to interrupt than a constant power of DC power. Hope that makes sense. So, if you need 
to find a circuit breaker. Find a DC rated circuit breaker. They're out there. Make sure you do not use an AC circuit breaker. It will not work and you could seriously cause major problems with your electrical system. Now we're going to talk about a few special nuances in our system. When do we convert down to 12 volt? When do we stay at 24 volt? And some little specialties. So some things, if you're running 24 volt DC, you're not going to be able to find in 24 volt DC. There's a lot of things you'll find, like our water pumps 24 volt, our lights are 24 volt, but there's certain things like our composting toilet we could only get in 12 volt. So for that, we use a DC to DC converter. It's only 5 amp, it only runs the toilet, and that's about it. It's pretty simple. We do the same in the cab for a lot of instrument gauges and stuff are all 12 volt. The benefit of this is they're actually only going to see 12 volt. So your DC to DC will make sure it's not going to output a charge voltage of 14.2 volt, it's actually going to put out 12.5 or whatever it, the device should be rated for. Now, we've done the same for our lighting. So our lighting is Hefele lighting, which we can show you in a room tour if we ever get to doing one. Um, and it's a really cool system that runs on 24 volt DC power. So what we were thinking was, sweet, we can just 24 volt, plug it straight in, and off it goes. Because there's Bluetooth mesh controllers, the lights themselves, and all the different switches that all could theoretically run on 24 volts. Well, wrong. The mesh controllers, which are the Bluetooth mesh controllers, are actually very sensitive to voltage fluctuations. So in this case, we actually had to install something that's called a voltage regulator. So this can you can input a voltage of 18 to 36 volts into this voltage regulator and it will output a flat 24 volts. And that is purely to protect this Bluetooth mesh controller and that's the only place we've actually had to do this. Now overall we have to say all of this gear has survived 50 plus degree temperatures when we were in Darwin and the van get, the truck just gets super hot and probably thousands of kilometers of corrugation so for that fact we have to say we're pretty happy that nothing major has failed yet knock on wood. All right hope I didn't bore you guys too much and hopefully you got something out of this if you did It'd be nice if you leave us a thumbs up and maybe consider subscribing. Contrary to popular belief, it is free.